our first speaker, Ernest Arietti. So Ernest is the Secretary General of the African Research University Alliance and board chair of the African Economic Research Consortium. He, he's a former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, and he was the first director of the African Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute in Washington. Um, so Ernest, the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much for inviting me to uh, be a part of this uh, IAU event. I'm trying to share my screen. I don't know if you can see it. Can you, can you see my screen? Not seeing your screen uh, just yet. Just a second. Doesn't seem to be working. Um, Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, we're not seeing your screen. Um, do you happen to be using, is it just a single monitor that you're using? Yes, it is. And when you hit the, the share button at the bottom of your screen, the green share button. I did that, uh, just one second. Oh, just... Can you see the screen now? Yes, I can see your screen now. Ah, okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so we, we can see the preparation uh, screen. So if you'd like to go into your, your, your slide delivery. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank, thank you very, very much. And sorry for the uh, delay in getting this to you. Basically, um, I, 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 I tried to make the point in this presentation that we can indeed unlock uh, knowledge systems in Africa. Uh, and um, a very important way to do this is through collaboration. Uh, so there are two main messages that I want to put out in this short presentation. Uh, first, is that uh, by working together uh, in the area of graduate training and research, we can uh, a lot more easily uh, unlock knowledge systems in Africa. Uh, in order to do this, uh, universities must believe uh, in the need to share resources. Uh, they must believe in the need to share faculty and students, and they must also uh, believe in the need for governance systems that allow for differentiation and uh, greater partnerships. So why is this important? Uh, what is the motivation for, for pursuing this? Uh, I mean, this comes from the type of environment in which we find ourselves uh, basically uh, it's important to ask ourselves the question whether our universities are able to deal with some of the contemporary challenges that we face, including climate change, poverty, uh, poor infrastructure, pandemics, life studies. There are many, many things that require the attention of universities. Uh, they require the attention of universities adding to uh, knowledge available. Uh, and so that's why we need to uh, address these uh, through the, the arrangement that we have in place. Uh, we ask ourselves whether our universities are preserving knowledge for future use, uh, whether we are providing solutions to today's problems. Uh, these are all over the place. And uh, we know that universities have faced challenges over the years uh, in trying to provide solutions to these. Uh, there are questions about the relevance of what we teach. There are questions about whether our uh, products are fit for purpose. There are questions about how we compare with uh, new types of uh, institutions providing higher education also. Uh, the fact that women have a difficulty uh, getting access to higher education, uh, low funding for higher education, brain drain, poor ICT utilization, aging faculty, deteriorated infrastructure. These are all things that have over the past uh, several decades uh, made it difficult for universities to play their roles uh, of providing knowledge for solving problems. Uh, today, 
Uh, we believe that it's possible. It is possible to, to do this. It is possible through uh, uh, collaboration. And here, I'm going to give you two instances of collaboration that we, we are uh, pursuing, uh, which I believe uh, could help us address the challenges. So we've got to believe in South-South co uh, collaboration. Within uh, Africa, to my, the network that I represent, the African Research Universities Alliance, uh, has decided that uh, it's going to very effectively work among the 16 universities that are members, uh, share resources, share faculty, share students. These are things that we, we want to do. Uh, and in so doing, we have created what we call the Centers of Excellence. And I'll, I'll give you details of that in a minute. What is driving this is mutual respect, the understanding that our university alone cannot solve those problems as we have to work with others. So that mutual respect driving uh, the need for collaboration is what leads to our South-South uh, collaboration. And then there's a North-South collaboration. And the example I give is what Aruba is doing with the Guild of Research Intensive Universities in Europe, through which we are creating what we call the clusters of excellence in pursuit of uh, the EU, AU innovation agenda. And this is driven by the need for equitable partnerships. So there are two types of uh, excellence centers that we are creating, the, the centers for Africa, and then the centers with between Africa uh, and Europe. So Arua is made up of 16 universities. I, I mentioned them here, uh, predominantly South African, but also working with the universities in other parts of Africa. How do we, through this arrangement, allow us to take advantage of the rich potential of each of these 16? That's what this uh, network is all about. And through uh, uh, collaboration, we've created these uh, 13 centers of excellence, which are hosted by our member universities, both in South Africa and in other parts of Africa. They tackle both the natural sciences and then the social sciences and humanities. So that's what Arua has been trying to do in order to unlock the knowledge available in Africa. So the, the centers of excellence are supposed to be a place where uh, researchers from different different locations are able to gather, uh, either virtually or uh, physically, to do research, to do cutting edge research, to do research that otherwise would not be possible. Uh, they are also supposed to help in the development of PhD programs and produce high or world class uh, uh, researchers and so on. So that's what I is about. Now, what we've tried to do is work with the Guild of uh, European Research Intensive Universities to develop clusters of research excellence. And these clusters basically will take an African hub, one of the African universities that we have in our network as a hub, working with another European university as the hub. And each of these two would have a number of spoke universities that are attached to it. Through this, we are able to get a cluster of about eight or nine or 10, depending on uh, the interest, working together. They work together to do joint research. They work together to produce graduate students, especially PhD students, uh, and help with the supervision. What this means is that African universities are working with their European colleagues to improve on the quality of the research being done here, and also improve on the quality of the graduate training that's available to African students. The beauty of this, as a result of the collaboration, we are able to develop the infrastructure in Africa with support from the European Union, as what the, the intention is. Uh, we are able to provide the type of environment that would help prevent or reduce the brain drain. What this means is that African researchers can live in Africa and do research as of high quality, do research that would have been done if they had worked or studied in Europe. Um, they, they were part of networks that are essentially well-resourced, uh, well-catered for, well-managed. And so they can live in Africa and do that. It takes away every incentive to want to live in Europe. We believe as a result of that, the African knowledge systems will be unlocked. It will be a lot easier for African governments to find relevant uh, evidence to support their policies. It will be a lot easier 
to deal with pandemics, a lot easier to deal with the food security challenges of Africa, a lot easier to deal with unemployment problems, the poverty problems, the inequality problems. That's how we think the future for African higher education should be structured. Thank you very much. So my conclusion here is that uh, we can make a difference uh, to the uh, unlocking knowledge systems in Africa if we work together. We must prepare for this new future by making the right investments and developing the right partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. Our second speaker is Sven Stolen. He's director of the University of Oslo. He's a professor of chemistry with research interests in inorganic materials, especially relationships between structure and properties. He has also been elected the first president of the European University Alliance Circle U. He chairs the board of Norway's first innovation district, Oslo Science City, and is the deputy chair of the board of the Guild of the European Research Intensive Universities and board member of Oslo University Hospital. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me first express my gratitude for being invited to this important conference. It's a pleasure to be in the beautiful green country of Ireland and in Dublin, a terrific, impressive city. It's also an important and timely uh, plenary session that I'm invited to, uh, unlocking knowledge system for an interconnected future. And we are, as a global society, interconnected and intertwined. Local challenges are often global, and global challenges reach every corner of the world faster than we like. What is clear is that uh, such challenges cannot be solved by one discipline, nor one sector, nor one country alone. So at the University of Oslo, our strategy is to connect our local, our national, our European, and our global activities and priorities as far as reasonable and as far as possible. And University of Oslo is a comprehensive research intensive university. Of course, we have a prominent place in Norway. We were part of the liberation fight for Norway. We established before Norway became a nation. So we are important in Norway. We are important for Oslo. But today I'm more interested in how we work with the rest of the world. And we are an international university. And the Guild has always be, or already been mentioned by my friend Ernest, and I come back to, to the Guild and the uh, Arua Guild initiative a little bit later. But this was important for us as a university, one of the founding members of the Guild of Research Intensive Universities back in 2016. It's about having influence on the politics for research, innovation, and education in Europe. And then we use this as a platform also for global collaboration. So in addition to the Guild, we are also heavily involved in one of these European alliances, Circle U. And that is really what I would call a new tool in the toolbox for universities. It's a new way of working. We will try to create a common campus for nine European universities. Uh, the ultimate goal by Brussels is to have maybe one campus with one student card. But I think that what we really are trying to do is to create new type of curriculums for the students, new type of opportunities for the students, but also reduce the challenges that we have in Europe, North, South, East, West, to take part in, uh, uh, how to say, a more widening participation in a large, to a large extent. And of course, when we do this, why do we do it? We do it because we believe we will, better from, we will be better as a university from collaboration. We're a tiny university in a tiny country far north outside the outskirts of Europe, so to say. So we have to collaborate. Of course, we collaborate with the rest of the world as well. If you look at a map that shows how much collaboration we have with researchers from different countries, with researchers at the University of Oslo, there are a few white spots. We have collaboration almost everywhere because we believe we will be enriched by collaboration. And that 
I guess, is the question today, how can we contribute to enrich the global society as a part of global society? And today, the question is pathways towards knowledge commons with fair access and open knowledge circulation. <clears throat> how does it look today? I think that the COVID-19 response is a good way to look into some of the pros and cons of globalization. It's both a success and a failure. Uh, it's a success because it shows the global nature of science. A Hungarian researcher working at an American university created the mRNA vaccine platform. Critical advancements were made in Canada and elsewhere. Vaccine-based mRNA was de developed by a German company with Turkish scientists. Global science cooperation resulted in what was a huge scientific achievement. And that's important to remember. On the other hand, it was also a failure. Hoarding of vaccines, production and distribution malfunction, refusal to allow developing countries to use the intellectual properties to produce vaccines, partly due to legal frameworks. But also, there were arguments about lack of capacity for research, for innovation, and for logistics. And I think that the same arguments we heard 10 years before, 10 years before that, 10 years before that. And I think that what we now need to do is to secure that next time we get a huge crisis, we are not in the same situation. We need to do better. We need long-term investment in addressing structural inequalities in the global academy. This is necessary and it's long overdue. If you do that in the global academy, you also do that in part for the global society. So when I'm discussing this, I will try to use two examples where University of Oslo is involved. One is the Arua Guild relationship that uh, Ernest already has talked about. It's a systemic type of approach. It's top down. It's about institutions. The other example is the opposite. It's a project focused uh, collaboration. It's bottom up. It's made by some of the strongest scientists at the University of Oslo. Robust local research groups throughout the world it has been the aim, and they have managed since they started in 1994. It's not one solution on how you work with these type of issues. These are two extremes, and there are not only two uh, ways of working either. You can do this in a lot of different ways, of course. Let's start with the Health Information System Program Center. This is a global action research network initiated in collaboration with the University of Western Cape in 1994, an important year in the history of South Africa, of course. It's the world's largest health information platform at these days, deployed by more than 100 countries, covering approximately 2.4 billion people potentially. It's an open source software for reporting, analysis, and dissemination of data for all health programs. And it has support from many. A different type of uh, supporting actors. What is it about? It's about global sharing based on local solutions in a collaborative network. What we do is that we have a hub, so to say, in Oslo, but they build nodes in different countries throughout the world. Regional and in-country capacity building is critical to do sustainable systems. We have 17 global health information groups with PhD leaders strong links to the local universities. So we provide long-term support, trusted partners that stay in the collaboration. Closeness to the field and the user is key when we develop this program. We have a PhD school at the University of Oslo. We have more importantly, possibly, also international master programs, for example, in South Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Sri Lanka. And now we try to take this platform further move beyond health and use this as a more generic platform, education and climate are the two next topics. So what we try to do is capacity building through local innovation. We start with, we have a rocket that you see at the bottom here. The platform development, the platform is absolutely necessary, open source. Then we work on the capacity, strengthening capacity. Out of that, we take it into the local context, try to have a participatory action so that you involve with the local society out of that, you get local innovation. So when Sri Lanka had the challenge of COVID-19, they used this program to track and meet the COVID-19 and they did it with success in a good way. Open source, the capacity was in Sri Lanka, and that's important. 
The other is the top down. And together with Arua and Ernest, the Secretary General, we called AU and EU to act as levers for widespread and coordinated support to the African Knowledge Society. It started back in July 2020 when we launched confront, Confronting Our Common Challenges. And the point is that if you're going to realize the ambitious objectives of African Union and European Union, we need to invest in African universities research capacity. So we called for investing in center of excellence built on sustainable alliances. And Ernest has already discussed it to some extent. In parallel, we have seen that the EU and AU has agreed on an innovation agenda, spring 2022. It sees universities at gateways between the continents, places science at the heart of development, creates a change paradigm for collaboration based on equal partnerships. Aim to support intercontinental partnerships, meeting places, and reduce brain drain from Africa by investing in uh, scientific career opportunities, but also infrastructure on the African continent. For now, therefore, policy priorities, it's public health, green transition, innovation and technology, and capacities for science. We are taking that further in collaboration with Arua. We try to build long-term partnerships through Center of Excellence. Not only Arua and the Guild, it's European universities, African universities. Alliances with three African universities located in different countries, for example, collaborate with alliances in, for example, three different countries in Europe, embedded in concrete societal realities spread geographically. And of course, open to interact with the rest of society. Each center of excellence will address a specific thematic cluster, building up capacities in research innovation and education through joint research projects, high quality master's program, doctoral schools, postdoctoral fellowships, appropriate administrative systems, research infrastructure and equipment. And also I think it's important to establish effective, effective um, offices for knowledge uh, transfer and innovation. So to sum up, I think that these two examples shows two ways to do it. It's not a solution, it's many ways to do such type of opening up for uh, uh, obviously sharing knowledge and, uh, and capacity. One was systemic, the other was project focused. I think that what is absolutely necessary when we see how interconnected we are, it's not enough with capacity in its own country. You need capacities in your neighboring countries. You need capacities in all countries. Is that we secure that the projects we do are embedded and rooted in local context. And, uh, Supporting the development of these institutions all over the globe should be an absolute priority. And the last statement I stole from Adam Habib in, the, in uh, the, the Horizon magazine, he says, as a human community, we must learn to swim together or we will collectively sink. Thank you. And our next speaker is Sarai Cordova Gonzalez. She's an honorary member of Latindex. Of the, uh, she's a retired professor from the Universidad de Costa Rica. She holds a master's degree in adult education and in library science from the Universidad de Costa Rica. She built the first institutional repository and the scientific journals portal for the, the University of Costa Rica. And her research focuses on the areas of scientific communication, open science, and open access. So, Good afternoon. It's a great honor to me to be in this conference, and I thank the organizer for the invitation. I come from a small country located in Central America at the waist of the Americas, with a little more than 5 million inhabitants covered with forests, volcanoes, and beaches. Costa Rica has five public universities that produce about 80% of the national knowledge, and I am a product 
of the largest of them, the University of Costa Rica. In a brighter note, we would recognize that the knowledge production in the global south is now more visible. It has been gaining value and has aroused the interest of the world academic community. Thanks to the great efforts that have been made in the last two decades. In 1995, Wade Gibbs denounces that how the scientific production of the third world was lost and demonstrated the invisibility that the countries of the global south had in the mainstream journals. This was a wake up call about the issues and a cause for concern. Interestingly, a few months before this article appeared. During the Guadalajara Book Fair, the idea of creating the first information system to bring together the Ibero-American region scientific journals was launched. Its name is Latindex and is formally it formally appeared in 1997 with the participation of only four countries, Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil, and Cuba. Today, it covers 23. This initiative triggered many others, such as the appearance of CLO, In the, that same year, the Virtual Library of Claxo in 22, Redalic in 23, La Referencia, the Federal Network of Institutional Repositories of Scientific Publications, member of Open Air, the repository, the European repository, Latin Rev. Latin American Network of Scholarly Journals in Social Science and Humanities in, 19, in 2017, and America in the, no, the Open Knowledge Nonprofit Academy Owned Open Access. All of these systems function as collaborative organizations that is supported by an institution that provides material and human resources to offer different services and products according to academic and scientific needs. For example, Latindex operates with the contribution of 23 countries from the Ibero-American region and the Caribbean, 13 of which 64% do so through universities. La Referencia, with the contribution of 13 organizations that you can see in the, this graphic. Although many of them have several resources restrictions, since they work mainly with state funds, each of these universities contrib contributes to the work that jointly sustains and develops the system. It is not about volunteering. It happens because universities and governments understand the importance of making knowledge visible and invest resources in knowledge dissemination. For example, in order to revamp the Latindex website last June, the National Autonomous University of Mexico assigned several people working full-time as it has been done since 1997. Last August, Redalic and La Referencia signed an agreement that allows data to be exchanged between both systems. We have the example of Redalic and America, which have their own building on the campus of the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, 
in addition to human resources provided by the university, together with other external resources from international organizations, they contribute to sustain and develop the services that these systems offer to the region. Cielo is also supported by numerous institutions within Brazil. In addition, each member country contributes with the necessary resources to keep its collection up to date. Latin America presents particular characteristics because knowledge has grown and developed in the hands of the university. We have always shared this wealth with the world and even more so when the internet allowed us to connect from north to south and from east to west. It is true this previous excite existing practice in our region, which has was later called open access, that we have disseminated our products throughout the world. Indeed, it has been very common for us to share knowledge through exchange and donation before the internet, when information and knowledge began to become visible through the aforementioned system. Nowadays, Latin America has nearly 3,000 quality journals and 765 repositories and 650 journal portals. The vast majority of these portals in Latin America are built with free software developed by the Public Knowledge Project, the Open Journal System, and most of the journal focus on relevant, relevant issues as rural de development, local histories, and indigenous, indigenous cultures. As pointed out by Johan Rodrik from Coalition, Yes, I open quote. It is also true that while Latin America was developing open access the right way, the rest of the world was taken over by commercial and social society publishers that extracted great profits or supplies from relatively indolent northern and western research communities. I close. The quote. However, he goes on the on to point out that they, the global north, cannot isolate the commercial sector from publishing and therefore create Plan S. These differences have been discussed to the point of using two versions: commercial open access, the Golden Way versus non-commercial open access, the diamond way. Faced with this dilemma, we think that open access should not leave the hands of the academic community to fall into those of the sector that profits from knowledge, as everyone knows. To this end, it is more appropriate for funders to direct the resources to support journals and research rather than paying article processing charge, APC. This solution is viable and was demonstrated during the pandemic because of the need of the op to open access the to knowledge so that the scientific advances that humanity urgently needed were made possible. Some of the main publishing companies opened their collections for a short time, recognizing thus the need to open or not keep knowledge under lock and key. Europe has also demonstrated with OPERAS, the European Research Infrastructure for the Development of Open scholarly communication in the social science and the humanities, 
and the action plan for Diamond Open Access, the interest and motivation to open up knowledge, strengthen cooperation more than competition, and thus to give fire value to scientific production globally. In the last five years, the world has moved not only toward open access, but also toward open science, which is a most broader company concept. In consequence, the various agents of open science must seek the application of open models of evaluation of science, must develop open infrastructures to disseminate knowledge, must share metadata and research data as much as possible, and so should work on citizen science as well as other similar activities. So to answer the question posed in this table, what are the pathways toward a meaningful and system-wide discussion on creating knowledge commons with fair access and open knowledge circulation, I will have to resort in the most recent calls for attention in the world, the UNESCO recommendation for open science and the Budapest Open Access Initiative for the declaration of 20th anniversary. In this sense, I wish to highlight two key ideas. The definition of open science that you can see here that combines various movements and practices. And the four high level recommendation for Budapest Open Access Initiative in 20th anniversary. This pronouncement expressed with crystal clarity what the organizations that produce knowledge, including universities, must do in the coming years. It is not possible for knowledge to remain under lock in the main centers that generate it. We have the free infrastructure to generate repositories of publications, data, reprints, or open educational resources. These are tools that can be used and promoted in university. In addition, there must be policy that encourage the deposit of scientific production in institutional repositories and that promote the distribution of incentives so that academics agree to share the production. Likewise, training campaigns must be developed so that knowledge ceases to remain under the key of the commercial domain and instead become a common good for humanity. The systems and, product, and products developed in the Latin American region could work with other communities in order for which it is important to establish collaborative links between universities and other organizations that work in the scientific and technological field. In proceeding with this orientation, access to knowledge will be increasingly free and open, and science will reproduce more rapidly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarai. All right, so we're gonna have ample time for discussion and I'm just gonna kick us off with a couple of questions and then I want to really open it up to all of you uh, to follow up on these very interesting uh, presentations that have shown, I think some very interesting efforts towards um, 
improving knowledge circulation. First question I want to ask, and maybe Sven, you, you will start, is what do you think are the other multidimensional elements of open science? We had a detailed talk on open access, but what are the other elements? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the talk. And I think that the platform they have is an example that we should follow uh, uh, generally. But I think that open science, uh, of course, uh, is broader. Uh, and I think that one of the challenges is to share uh, not only the publication, but the codes, the uh, infrastructure possibly to make access. And so to say, I think that what my main, how to say, thought is, is that without the capacity to use what is open, then you look out. So, so, so the, the reason I'm stressing capacity to that extent is that you need the capacity in order to use this open data, science, codes, infrastructure, and so on. Right. Can I just follow up on that? What about the role of policies in this? The policy is, is, uh, is uh, important, of course, both for, for this part and, and general. I think that uh, if you talk about Plan S, I think that the biggest challenge was that it was fragmented to some degree, the, the initiative. You left it up to each individual country to do the, uh, to the, the, do the negotiation with the big uh, companies elsewhere and so on. I think that was difficult. And you could have started also in the other end, start with the learned societies and it made sure that you had some really strong journals from the learned societies. So I think that to, to we're back to some of the issues we discussed earlier today that we have to be in the front seat. We should probably have done the, some of this ourselves earlier and then maybe we had avoided some of the challenges that was an effect of politicians, how to say, making the strategy. Um, Ernest, would you like to add something to this first question about the elements, the multidimensional elements of open science? Yeah, I, I agree entirely with what Swainer just said. Um, the capacity to take advantage of open science uh, is largely uh, determined by what infrastructure is available uh, to potential users. Uh, in Africa, that has been the major or the, the, the largest drawback, uh, making it difficult for uh, researchers, potential researchers to take advantage of, of what's available openly. So in all the discussions that uh, we undertake uh, with respect to open science, uh, we have always emphasized the need to create a field, a much more level playing field, one that allows one uh, researchers here to, to be able to more or less uh, compete with everybody else uh, in having access. So yes, I agree with what Svena said. Preparing people for that is important. I would you like to add something. Yeah, I um, I want to talk that Africa is participating in some of the systems, Latin American systems. For example, um, South Africa is participating in Cielo, and uh, Angola is participating in Redalic right now, and we are very hopeful that many other countries can share our experience and uh, make possible this relationship uh, between South and South. Thank you. Um, I have another question. I mean, we've been talking about some really interesting examples of that are trying to um, bridge the gap in science, technology, and innovation. You gave some very concrete examples, Vane and, and Ernest as well. I mean, and these gaps can be both at, at the stage of the creation uh, 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 or discovery, creation of knowledge or discoveries. It could be at the level of dissemination or diffusion. It could be at the level of just capacity building in terms of human resources or the infrastructure. And it can also be at the level of the application or usage of that. 
I mean, where where do you see is really the you know what 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 is going to impede be, be the biggest barriers uh, to bridge these gaps? Uh, I really think that the main challenge with some of the um, the, the challenges we are meeting is the lack of strong institutions, as also uh, Ernest has pointed out, that are able to meet um, new problems locally. So I think that, uh, Ernest, if I'm right, I think that 70% of uh, Africans sure. taking a PhD in Western world are not yep. going back. That means that to build institutions that have possibilities for career, that has the infrastructure that makes work in that country possible, that have institutions that are robust, where you have an administration, administration that can support. So institution building, I think, is extremely important to meet the future challenges. And if you do that, it's not about research or education or innovation. It's about having an institution that is robust and can, how to say, deal with all aspects of the university. But let me just question this a little bit in the sense because we want to do this in terms of the capacity building of the institutions. But once you are able to have the right talent, you're going to need a equivalent amount of resources than in the rest of the world to do the same kind of, of science if you want or innovation. And there, there's a big gap. It is. And, and, and I, I think that's part of what they try to change to some extent in the AU EU innovation agenda. I think that Brussels put in 350 million euros in the last research uh, call, 150 million euros in the last education call. And the way I see it, they are dedicated to invest heavily. But I agree, uh, it's, it's, it's how to say, it's a, it's, it's a path forward. Um, if, I, if I'm allowed, I could take an example back in the history of the University of Oslo, because it was established in 1811. It was uh, before we became a separate university. We had fought for 150 years to become a separate nation. And then uh, we were able to build a weak university. And what did we do? We sent PhD students out in Europe, out in the world. They learned, they came back, and they built it gradually. So I don't think it's a quick fix. That's my point. But we have to work in a more strategic way. Instead of doing short-term collaborative projects, I think that focus towards institution building is the right way forward. Ernest, can I ask you, following up on this even more, the scale of Africa. You have shown some very interesting examples, but the challenge of the scale is enormous. So would you like to comment on that? Sure. My, my point here would be that uh, once institutions agree to work together, um, they are much more likely to find answers to those challenges. And one example I'll give you uh, will be um, what we're doing in the area of vaccine development. You know, uh, there's hardly any uh, uh, African country that has uh, a strong capacity uh, to do the kind of research that is going to lead to the development of vaccines. We've seen some improvements in South Africa. We've seen some in Egypt, in Morocco. Uh, some a bit of in Senegal, but that there are very few African countries that have that capacity. What we have done is develop vaccine hubs. Uh, we have one for Western Africa, which is based at the University of Ghana, and one for Eastern Africa, based at Makerere University. What these hubs do is, uh, with limited resources, bring together teams of researchers from the sub-region. So uh, the center that we have in Ghana, at the University of Ghana, the West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, it allows researchers from Nigeria, from Ibadan, from Lagos, that brings in people from Senegal, from other French-speaking African countries to work in their labs, to work with their students. And through that, we are building a large capacity uh, of people that have very good backgrounds in vaccine development research. We are doing the same in East Africa, uh, working with uh, Nairobi, working with Rwanda, Burundi, Addis Ababa uh, University. Um, 
Dar es Salaam, and again, building capacity there. What I see happening in the very near future is that a very, very uh, good crop of young African researchers that are able to do cutting edge research in this particular area. And it, if we move from uh, vaccine research, we can talk about food security. We are working together in area of uh, uh, crop improvements, uh, in area of water conservation, we are doing some work bringing people together from different countries, different institutions. So in my view, all the gaps that we find in STI with time uh, will be dealt with by working together. Um, working together for me offers the best way to uh, generate the resources. It offers the best way uh, to find new resources and the best way to use available resources more efficiently. Um, so that's, that's the way forward. And I believe that the through co-creation uh, we should be able to uh, narrow the gap between African science and, and what we find in the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question for you. You showed the main actors in the, all of these initiatives, but were, was there any multilateral institution organization that was also very helpful in promoting and facilitating the development of these open access platforms? Yes, the, well, uh, as uh, I am talking about Latin America, the organization of uh, American states was uh, collaborating with Latindex, for example. And now Red Ali had, has uh, many other collaboration from Europe. The, um, I don't remember the name of the projects, but they have two uh, main um, uh, funds that they gain, and they are um, uh, trying to use this for better results and to uh, have um, more uh, work to, to, to grow the, the, the work in uh, the region. And also there are many other, UNESCO was uh, one of the uh, organization that has collaborated, have collaborated with us, uh, with Latindex mainly. And in Claxo, it is very important, the paper, the role of a uh, UNESCO role. And we are uh, working with uh, right now with um, with UNESCO and uh, to uh, with the recommendations we work to making the consulting to the members of Latin American members, and uh, there are more collaboration in this sense. I don't remember the details, but. So Svein, a question. What is the role for science diplomacy for enhancing knowledge circulation and capacity building? No, I, I think it's, it's uh, I, I always feel science diplomacy is a different uh, term to be honest, but, but if we talk about how you talk with decision makers all over the world, how you take with society, talk with society, I think it's immensely important because I think in order to attach the inequalities that we see in the world, we really need to have support from politicians from, from a large part of the countries and so on. So I think that it's extremely important to present what we are doing as value-based suggestions for how to deal with the challenges that we see. And, uh, and if I'm allowed, I, 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 what I think that we're doing now is we're trying to see new solutions. We try to be in the front seat of the car. So I'm happy to see other solutions to solve the challenge, of course. I think the African Union, the European Union is an interesting uh, way forward. The other thing is that what is, uh, has made a big change in Europe, the European University initiatives. It really has changed how we work together. 
And I was in Poln last week and I heard a previous um, rector at the University of Warsaw describing how this alliance they, that they are a member of work together across countries. And that had made a completely different way of working with the other universities in Europe because now it was the success of the alliance, not of the separate university. It's still competition between, but it's also strong collaboration. So maybe that's also part of what we see here that to have alliances also towards Africa or other parts of the world, also when it's institutional gives better pressure on the development, hopefully. Okay, thank you. So let me open up to the public. Yes, okay, Rambir. I'm uh, Professor Ranbir Singh. I'm a pro professor of law. Beyond science, there are other disciplines where free access has been available. Like, for example, in law, the, this moment was started more than 30 years back in Corn. And the free access to law movement is so popular now that almost in every country, there is a free legal information institute available. It may be Ashley, it may be Canley, it may be Americanly, it may be Indialy. Now, almost everything in law, it may be a case law, it may be a legislation, it may be an article, uh, because software is very costly, uh, which we were using. But now, almost everything on earth is available in free access as far as law is concerned across the globe. Thank you. I am Sandeep Mishra, uh, Vice Chancellor, NIMS University, Jaipur in India. So excellent presentation, Dr. Sen. Uh, uh, my uh, kind of comment, uh, like how to apply, you know, global into local needs. So, you know, coming to the vaccine uh, program, uh, I'm talking about vaccine program in India. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of options. So mRNA was a good option. The problem is that in mRNA, you have to have a freezer, which is minus 80 degree. And, and with a country like India, with uh, billions of population, you require, you know, many freezers. And that would itself cost a lot. So India actually took a different uh, way and uh, there were two things. One, we collaborated with Oxford and developed a vaccine, Covishield, which was a live attenuated virus vaccine. And it requires a temperature of about five degrees between, uh, you know, like around five degrees, between uh, five to 10 degrees, something like that. And the other option was to develop an indigenous vaccine, which was a killed virus. And that was uh, the Covaxin. And then with this, uh, you know, application of this uh, and collaboration with the Oxford University, developing two kinds of vaccines, and then we are able to uh, give to, you know, more than, uh, let us say, 100 million uh, population this way in this temperature range. So I think uh, that is a good thing. And the, uh, and the other thing was, as I said, with Oxford, you know, the vaccine was developed in Oxford, but India was able to scale up the production to millions. and could even export it to many countries. And in India, it was given free of cost. So something like Norway. Yeah. So it was like other things are all costing something, but this vaccine thing uh, was given free of cost to you know, anybody uh, within that bracket. So, so I think that was an example of how India could work. And uh, so we would be very interested in collaborating with other institutions uh, to develop certain products. So I mean, that was my... Thank you. Uh, my name is Nanaba Apiampo, Vice Chancellor, University of Ghana. I'd like to thank all the presenters for very insightful uh, presentations. And uh, particularly to Swain, you talked about the successes and the failures or challenges of. COVID, and you mentioned two things, uh, lack of capacity and the lack of appropriate uh, legal frameworks. I suppose that with the lack of capacity as higher education institutions, universities, we are addressing these through the partnerships that 
both you and Ernest uh, talked about. But while we do that, how do we, one, address the issue of appropriate legal frameworks and the politics that come with it? And then also, while we're on these partnerships, how do we ensure truly equitable partnerships dealing with issues of intellectual property, uh, research, application, and even commercialization? Thank you. I, I, I think it was a beautiful example. Um, uh, I'll try to comment that, and then I hope I remember what you asked. I, I'm always bad at remembering things, but Priscilla, I, I think that that to connect the local and the, 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 the global is important. And that is what we try also. I mean, in Oslo, we have focus on life science, on energy, on democracy as strategic initiatives. We use the same in Oslo, we use the same in Circle U. And that's also where we see that we have a possibility further on. So, so in a sort, it's, it's, it's um, certain areas where I think we can contribute better and other because we have the expertise. And then, you have for a new university and other expertise that other could benefit from. So I think that's a way forward. When it, when it comes to 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 the to to the law question, it's it's really challenging. I think that Norway, when this question was raised, was not on the right side of the decision uh, as a country. Um, I think we need to uh, work forward. I'm not an expert on the on the legal issues, but that is a big challenge, of course. When you come to the alliances. How do we secure that they are equitable? I think we can't be sure. We have to push and believe that uh, the, the, the universities and the leaders involved really mean what they say when they go into these type of alliances. And we have to go into challenges with regards to intellectual property rights and so on. I, I agree completely that will be a challenge, but uh, I think it's, it must be a value-based type of collaborations. And I must say that if I look at university, like University of Oslo and the other Norwegian universities, I think that throughout many, many years, they have, we have had very dedicated scientists that wants to go in this direction. And they also put pressure on the university leadership. So I think that we have to, to, to make sure that bottom up and top down talks together. And I can only say that this is the way we need to go, but, but I agree, it's not completely easy. Uh, well, it's very refreshing, I mean, to hear all the efforts that particularly European universities uh, in collaboration with uh, African universities are doing in terms of collaboration for doing common research and, and so on. Nevertheless, it calls my attention that despite all that uh, collaboration, uh, universities were not able to create vaccines, except Oxford that made an alliance with, uh, with a consortium, I mean, to do that. It's, it's a strange, I mean, that uh, despite all that um, capacity of working together and ma making uh, information to flow all over uh, the places, uh, that didn't happen. I would like to know, I mean, why, in your opinion, uh, that happened? And the second thing is that um, in Latin America, uh, unfortunately, is the less integrated educational uh, part of the world. Um, there are very powerful uh, universities like Sao Paulo. Uh, the power, the, the, not only Sao Paulo University, but the, the universities of the Sao Paulo state, UNAM, uh, uh, um, I mean the Argentinian universities and so on. Um, they don't they don't collaborate. I mean they were also unable, despite the fact, I mean that they had the capacities and they were doing things, uh, or they, they were doing research to get uh, to get uh, vaccines. They prefer to work uh, indiv individually. I mean, we even, as, a, as an organization, called them I mean, to try to collaborate and, uh, and nothing happened. The only country that was able to do that was Cuba. I mean, Cuba by itself created three, uh, three vaccines. 
And, la and lastly, I want to say that on one occasion, uh, because of the resources uh, issue that uh, is, uh, has been uh, mentioned, on one occasion, we asked the Inter Interdevelopment Bank uh, the, for, that exists, I mean, for promoting investment in Latin America, we asked uh, money, I mean, to create this network of labs. I mean, and the answer was, is not of our interest. Interesting. May I come in? On IPR systems, there are two uh, IPR uh, two systems actually. One is sponsored research, and uh, where it is sponsored by the industry. Then IPR is for money, is a market. The other system is for public good and open science. Now the more uh, tilt is towards the open science and uh, the public good movement in even in America. So that's what is happening. Uh, and my name is Dr. Ahmed, uh, Rector of Abrar University from Somalia. Uh, and I'm very glad uh, to be here with you. And this presentation is from the professors. I just want to comment for the professor from University of Oslo. Uh, it is good to hear that uh, um, bottom up and top down uh, and success and challenges and you my experience you are data like a selection process is also a very uh, critical point for bottom up and the other thing the awareness of the community that uh, the project is will be delivered if they are not aware it also an uh, affect is the successness of the project and the effectiveness of the communication because I remember when I was working with the International Committee of the Red Cross, we were delivering some projects to protect the livelihood of uh, rural communities in conflict areas. And also it's a very challenging for the conflict areas according to the humanitarian and also according to the education sector. So when we delivered the project in the first time, the team did not uh, give them the good communication with the community that is uh, delivered to the project. And at the finally, they use it, uh, the material is uh, that prevented them from the vector borne diseases to their houses and to their agricultural farm. So when we come again, we found everything it's lost. So for the second time, we gave them uh, the same project but in other way for uh, awareness, I explaining to them one by one and community by community, and then I am giving them the ownership of, of the project. So that uh, exists very well for exit strategy for, for the project is. And the other thing for that I can say is success for education sector in Somalia, uh, in previous before the conflict, we only have one university uh, and that is governed by the government. And now we have a lot of universities, 99% uh, are private and only one um, public. So at that time when the government is collapsed, the university also collapsed and there is no education. And even uh, the primary and secondary schools were collapsed with the government. So from that, the scholars uh, started uh, privatization of the education sector, uh, which uh, it is succeeded uh, in these uh, 30 years uh, in fragile status, and even uh, contributed to the peace building of our country. And even nowadays, uh, grievously, uh, the educated people they did not recruit for uh, uh, this building like uh, militaries or uh, policy, but now they are entering and we have uh, the positive things. So I think uh, education sector integration with conflict areas or parallel status is also important. So as to contribute the SDGs, which also 
just eight years to end up, and some of uh, us did not know this SDD still. Even in Somalia, I think uh, in Mogadishu, before two months, the university was talking about what is SDG. So forget about the African agenda that is uh, 2063. So I think uh, awareness for all, it's better for success together. Thank you very much. Professor Arias, you would like to speak? May I? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, I wanted to uh, respond to the earlier query uh, where one of the participants mentioned that um, there was little involvement of universities in vaccine development. And um, I, I thought that was, uh, uh, it, it could be stated differently. Um, in my view, and from all the evidence available, uh, in, in a place like Africa, Without universities, uh, the impact of the pandemic in the region would have been much, much, much larger. In almost every country in the region, uh, the effort to fight the pandemic was led by universities, whether in the area of uh, testing, whether in the area of uh, uh, developing uh, vaccine research, of improving on sanitizers, the education, the awareness. In most countries, it was led by universities. Indeed, very few countries could have done anything about testing without their universities. Having said that, the, in the area of vaccine development, the role of universities around the world has been huge and always acknowledged. Uh, the teams, that worked on the Pfizer vaccine included universities. Uh, the teams that worked for the AstraZeneca vaccine included universities. And indeed, African universities, especially from South Africa, were very, very active in the Oxford team that worked with the AstraZeneca. So uh, it would not be fair to suggest that the universities have not been uh, very active in this area. Uh, what, what I think the pandemic allowed us to show was that universities, given the opportunity, would be able to rise to the occasion, and they did. They did with the pandemic in most countries around the region, uh, and they are continuing. As a result of this, I'm happy to see that uh, more interest in vaccine research is taking place in Africa. And I believe that vaccine research taking place as partnership between Africa and Europe but Africa and North America, maybe Africa and uh, South Asia, will improve, will improve. And I'm quite sure that Africa will be much better prepared for the next pandemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I am Professor Chindarande from uh, the Women's University in Africa, based in Zimbabwe. I have three points. Um, emanating from the presentation by Professor Ernest regarding the challenges in, in, in African universities. Uh, the first issue relates to funding. Um, what I've noticed is that uh, as a result of dwindling uh, resources to universities, that has actually also then affected the quality of uh, the teaching and learning within universities. I've noticed uh, that issues of staff welfare have also then uh, lost the attention of most um, of our stakeholders. So we are realizing a new form of brain drain. Um, I'll give an example in Zimbabwe, we have uh, 23 universities at the moment. And you find out that um, one lecturer could be hoping from one university to another. And there's an over-reliance on part-time lecturers that then affects the quality of the product that we are actually producing. So the issue of funding is um, uh, affecting quality uh, in, in, in several ways. Um, I've also noticed an issue around um, mass production of students because of uh, dwindling resources as well. 
um, there's an over-reliance on student fees. So as universities rely so much on student fees, there's an appetite to enroll as many students as possible. Um, and um, uh, at the end of the day, um, the resources, the infrastructure, the facilities are not commensurate with the numbers that we are enrolling. And uh, ultimately that also affects uh, the quality. So when we're talking about the relevance and value of universities within the context of dwindling uh, funding to universities, we are also ultimately forced to talk about issues of quality and um, the issues of uh, employability that uh, we have been talking about as well, that also then um, affects the employability of, of, of the graduates because they are half-backed, the product is not um, ready for, for the market. Um, uh, Professor Ernest also raised an issue around the low numbers of women. Um, I think we, we need to move the conversation further from affirmative action. We've talked a lot about affirmative action. We've also talked about subsidies, but I think uh, we also need to be looking at um, the relationship between higher education and primary and secondary, because we are at the far end of, of the tail. And um, the conversation should also involve primary and secondary uh, stakeholders, because they are also critical in the conversation on um, uh, uh, enrollment of, of women at higher um, education level, um, including conversations around internal systems, processes, and practices, including conversations around gender responsive pedagogy. Uh, what is it within um, the higher education systems that we are doing also to ensure that uh, we, we are talking about um, gender responsiveness um, in terms of how we are handling um, uh, curriculum issues, in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of the facilities that we have. So um, I think the conversations should be taken forward from just ensuring that we have affirmative action to engaging various stakeholders. Uh, what is the community saying about gender equality? Uh, what is primary and secondary education doing about gender equality? And internally, as higher education institutions, what are we doing also to address uh, the masculinities that characterize most of our institutions that might also be repelling uh, females from enrolling? So I think that also should be uh, the direction of our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ernest, would you like to respond? Yeah, um, well, uh, thank you for those comments. I mean, uh, I, I, I see exactly how the uh, um, absence of uh, adequate funding uh, is affecting many African universities. It's something that uh, uh, bothers us and uh, we've been uh, doing all we can to help in, uh, change the, the story. Uh, one of the things that we need to do uh, is uh, use uh, various uh, uh, initiatives to make African governments understand that investing in higher education uh, cannot be a wasteful venture. Uh, investing in higher education is certainly important for the future and putting money into research uh, should be considered a priority in your every country. Uh, I make the point all the time when I meet with African leaders that uh, there's no way, there's no way we can attain even a half of the SDGs uh, without new knowledge. And that new knowledge would only come from research. So by not putting enough into research, we are effectively uh, making it impossible to achieve the SDGs. That's an important point. And I, I see how uh, the absence of funding affects the universities. But I must also say that uh, today, I see African universities are willing to change the narrative, are making every effort, despite the funding challenges, to improve their conditions. So they find other ways of raising funds beyond charging fees to students. Uh, they do a lot with the private sector or try to do a lot with the private sector, uh, try to raise funds from international sources. As we can. So it's important in my view that African universities learn how to diversify 
uh, their uh, funding sources. Uh, also learn how to compete uh, for, for various grants and so on. And that's, that's something that it needs to be done. The issue about uh, gender uh, is something that's very important. Uh, what I'm happy about on that front is that again, the story is changing. Uh, today, uh, I find that the, the numbers are growing. We've just been looking at the numbers for uh, faculty and students in various African universities. And we've seen significant improvements uh, compared over the, over the last uh, decade. There have been improvements in various parts, even including the STEM areas. Uh, one of the things I'm very happy about is the uh, number of female faculty members has changed dramatically in some universities, uh, in others not so much. I'm very happy that uh, in the leadership of universities, the story is changing in Africa. Uh, the number of women as vice chancellors, and you have some in the room, uh, has shot up. And the, way, the number of women as deputy vice chancellors. When, when we began Arua uh, six years ago, there were only two women vice chancellors, deputy vice chancellors in the whole region. Uh, today, more than 40% of the deputy vice chancellors I work with are women. So things are changing. And what is important is for us to accept that uh, affirmative action can work, but uh, it, it, what is even better is a change in the mindset, trying to provide various incentives. Today, very, very few African universities would willingly put impediments in the way of, of women. Let's, let's encourage that. Let's, let's encourage them, support them, uh, make open doors for women and help the women to walk through. It's something that is going to grow, is growing, and has to be acknowledged. Uh, that there's a long way to go, and uh, with, with support from the international community, I believe that the African university in another 10 years will be very, very different from what we have today. Thank you for the discussions going on. I would like to make two comments. First, relating to the uh, discussion this morning, and Svein was also uh, uh, raising this, and we are talking about research and getting up with new knowledge. That's very important. But what we need to do to get the support from the governments, to get support from the society, is to have the capacity to transfer the knowledge already there into societies, into different um, stakeholders. And for that, we need researchers to be capable to do this. We need the students capable to do that. So I think that I would like us to be more open-minded to transfer what is already known. There is a lot of knowledge for sustainable development and for the future that is there. And with the open access, we will have even more of this. And I have to make a comment on the, the women's situation. And I would like to go back and say that we have to look to the merit system within the universities. If we are continuing to calculate C2 quantity productions of, of publications and so on, and not seeing other values, I think that that is a drawback for women. And there are reports already from the uh, situation during the pandemic, and that there are more female researchers falling behind not being able to write scientific papers and thereby they will not be comp competitive enough to get more research funding and thereby less publication. And that. so this is something I would like that we in the future is aware of and try to also do something about. Thank you very much. My name is Samson Sejidu. I'm Vice Chancellor of the University of Malaya. And I would like to uh, thank you, all the presenters, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, my comment is related to what the President has just said, and uh, of course, very much related to the topic of unlocking you know, knowledge systems for the future. The problem we have, particularly in uh, the Global South, when we're developing curriculum, the university, we are always required to be market relevant. It's like uh, 
you know, the stakeholders are dictating what we should be teaching. But we forget that as universities, we should also be creators of knowledge and also creators of new job opportunities. Uh, some of us, we tend to think that currently the jobs that we have on the market would be maybe 30% of the jobs that we're supposed to have in the universe. And we are not creating them. We are always, when we're doing research, we're looking at the current challenges uh, instead of also creating the challenges ourselves and creating new jo jobs on the same. So like, for example, when I was outside today, we had a chat with a colleague who was talking about physics for poets. Why not having, you know, this different kind of, you know, curriculum that will create new jobs out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last question. I'm Paul Katamba, Vice Chancellor of Gema University, Uganda. This is a private university. And on that basis, I want to make some two comments. One, Uganda has got about 56 universities. Those are six, let me say, eight of them are government owned. The rest are private universities. But the, the European cooperation with Africa is basically looking at government owned universities. So research funding, capacity building is done with government owned universities, maybe for political reasons. A lot of research done in private universities is wasted. There's no capacity building the private universities. There's no follow up on what's happening in private universities. And that has made us a brought a lot of bias between the private uh, universities and the, the government universities. I think Europe should consider that, that there are also private universities where research is being done, which need to be uh, uh, also influenced if the research is to become relevant and to develop capacity in Africa. And this is usually the story throughout Africa. Universities like Mackay University get a lot of funding, PhD scholarships, but when the universities, the private universities are not getting anything, and the, even the awareness of the availability of such opportunities is not communicated. On the other issue of the agenda of this research, what kind of transformation is considered or do we re evaluate in our an African community that's been generated by the research that has been done so far, looking at the European and Africa, African Union agenda. We need to make sure that the research that is done can transform our communities on the ground. A lot of research, PhD research is lying somewhere in the bookstores or on the shelves. And perhaps some of it is lying somewhere there in, here in Europe and has not been very useful to our communities. Yet our universities must contribute to the changes to the local community that are around us. We are turning out to be glorified universities and not contributing to the local community, which we are supposed to transform. So the transformative effect of this research needs to be evaluated by looking at these PhD people who are making research. A lot of them are coming from Africa, they study in Europe, but what is the relevance of their research to their communities back in Africa? Even around the communities within which the universities are located. Thank you very much. Well, let We've run out of time. I want to thank all of the panelists for their presentations. I also want to thank all of the people that have presented their comments or questions. I think uh, we understand that there have been some great initiatives that are going on. There are significant gaps and there needs to be contextualized according to the realities of all of the different places in the globe where we're coming from. But thank you again. Thank you very much.